Tonight we're in Genesis 19, Genesis chapter 19, and I titled this, Love for the World. Love for the World. This is a horrible chapter. I'm just going to say that right off the bat. Um, Another one of those chapters I'd like to just skip and go to the next one, Um, but it's here. We're going to look at it. If you know which chapter I'm in, well, then you know it's just just a a sin-filled chapter. James chapter 4 Verse 4 says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We're going to see that so clear, that Lot became a friend of the world, and in so doing became an enemy of God. And, and yes, he will be saved from the, the, the destruction of the cities, and, and, but his life was wasted through compromise. It was a wasted life. And we see here there's no gray area. You're either, you know, an enemy of God or you're not. Matthew 12, 30 says, Jesus said, He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Jesus said, you're for me or you're against me. There's two camps. And we can be in one of them. Even as believers, we can be in the against Jesus camp. And that should terrify us and break our hearts. Well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we... Look at this passage. I ask that you would challenge us to truly look at our lives and see if we're for you or against you. Show us if there's any compromise in our lives. And then help us to have the strength to break free from that compromise. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for the cross, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, verse 1. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. I know it's been a couple weeks, but if you remember back, Jesus and two angels showed up. Abraham was hospitable. He made them a meal. And then we saw this conversation that God allowed Abraham to be a part of as they as, as, as God you know, declared, we're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. There's judgment. We're going to go down there and check it out. And, and, and Abraham was like, well, what if there's 50 righteous? And then all the way down to 10. And God allowed him to be a part of the conversation. Now, towards the end of that, Jesus sent off the, the two angels. And, and they're first called angels here, but we know they are. So he, he sent them down and, and then spent a, a, a moment you know, there with Abraham, but, but we pick up here with the angels going down into Sodom and Gomorrah. So they come, and, and they come in the evening. And that's important, you know, as, as night fell, it was just dangerous. A lot of people, you didn't travel during the night, you know, it just wasn't safe to be out, and most of the world is still that way. And, I mean, just in Mexico, where we were, there were big fences, you know, and, and I, I, I challenged the, the students as we, you know, drove around. It's like, tell me what you see that's different. And obviously there's a lot different, but tell me what you see. And, and eventually it got around to, well, there's bars on the windows or there's, you know, tall fences and, and razor wire. And it's like, well, why? Because it's unsafe. Well, that's most of the world. That's most of the world today. It's how it was then. So it's evening time. We'll get back more to the, the evening here. But Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. Now, this didn't mean that he was just simply resting at the city gate. This meant that he was a leader of the city. He had invested to the point of leadership. Wow. The gate of the city in in that time was a place where leaders made decisions. They made judgments. They, They monitored people coming and going from the city. We see clearly Lot was a man of compromise compromising what he knew to be true about God and the standards that God wanted for him. And he compromised. And, and, and don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying it's sin for somebody to be in politics necessarily. We're going to see clearly that God was judging this whole city, that the immorality, the sin had gotten to the point where God was going to destroy them. And yet here we see Lot sitting at the gate. He had to have compromised a lot to get to that place. And I really want us to challenge our hearts tonight. What are we compromising? Because if we're compromising anything, big, small, it's 
sin. And it will lead to greater problems. We compromise with a little bit, you know, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to pay all my taxes. Hmm. Well, you know, I, I, all right, I showed up at, at 8 at work, but it was really 8.15. That's a compromise. We, we need to, to be people of integrity. Well, I know God says I shouldn't do that, but a little's okay. No, a little's never okay. A little's never okay. Okay, well, we see that Lot went from looking because uh, Lot and, and, and Abraham, they were growing bigger and bigger and their herds couldn't stay together. So a split was inevitable and, and, and Abraham said, pick any place you want. And he, he looked down into the valley and he said, ooh, down by Sodom and Gomorrah, that looks nice. So he moved, he looked and then he moved near and then he moved in. And then we see him completely invested, step by step, getting deeper and deeper into sin, further from God. But it all started with a look. It all started with a look and a want in his heart. So tonight, are you looking and wanting the things of this world? Now, again, not suggesting we don't work and we don't, you know, do these things, but are you wanting the, the sinful things of this world? 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It just doesn't get clearer than these verses. If our heart is invested in the things of this world, it can't be invested in God, period. It's just not. And these things shouldn't sound radical to us. They shouldn't be shocking like, wow, this is... Because God has a big plan and a purpose. And, and, and so often our culture softens everything. So none of this actually should sound crazy but how often do we see people living radically for God? Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed into what God wants for you. Mark 8, 36 says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? The truth is, if we seek the things of this world, it doesn't matter what we gain, but we go to hell. We've gained nothing. And these are big things, and it's easy to fix our eyes and go, well, if I just get that promotion, then I'll serve more at church. If I just, you'll never have enough. I've watched people say that time and time again, and they never have enough because they've compromised. They've compromised. There's a clear divide. There's the things of this world which are sinful, and there's the things of God which the world doesn't understand. The world doesn't understand. And yes, we understand the truth that we must live in the world, but not of the world. That is Scripture. We're here, but we shouldn't look like everybody else. We should act different. We should talk different. We should respond different. And people should see Christ in what we do. The desires of our heart need to be the things of God. So it can't just be an outward expression that we're, well, we mustered up enough strength to, to do these things Christian-wise. That's not enough. It must come from our heart. And that only happens when we fully surrender to Jesus. You're never going to come to a place where you had enough strength to, to do this. You must surrender it all. Lay everything at the feet of Jesus and then see what he's going to do. And that's scary. That is scary. My prayer for everybody on the mission trip, and I told everybody there, and it's still my prayer, and really it's my prayer for you guys, but, but on the mission trip, I told them, I said, my prayer is that you will be ruined for normal life. That you will be unsatisfied and unfulfilled to go back and do the American Thing, whatever that is, to seek the American dream, to acquire and to gain and to, to, to I, I just, and that was my deep prayer and it is my deep prayer for all of us that we would be so just ruined by how much God has transformed us that we just can't go back. We can't seek the things of this world for ourselves. We must live for Jesus. And that doesn't mean we all become missionaries, but it does mean we should all be radically sold out and changed where we're just not satisfied 
with becoming the next great anything. And if we become the next great something, we'll praise God, use it for him. But it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Let's be changed. Let's be wrecked for normal life according to our culture or the world's culture. So again, are you living for the things of this world? Are you living for the things of Jesus? We're going to see that the compromises that Lot made, well, how they affected his entire family, well, it ended in destruction. It ended in destruction, and, and ultimately, he had no witness at all for God with his culture and with his children. And that, that should be heartbreaking. That should be heartbreaking. Verse 2 and he said, Hear now, my lords. Please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly. So they turned into him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. He, he urged them to come. Now, we understand hospitality was a big thing, but it wasn't something they forced on people. So it is strange that he so strongly wanted them not to spend the night. Well, he understood the city he lived in. He understood the dangers, I'm sure, that staying in the square would not have been good. It wasn't good ultimately in his own house. It's possible the, the angels were just trying to see how strongly he would pursue protecting and, and taking care of them, but he insisted strongly. It's easy to turn a blind eye, to just look away. Oh, they really didn't want help. How passionate are we to help people? It would appear that he was really trying to do the right thing here. We know from the New Testament that he was a man. Lot was a man tortured by the culture around him. Although filled with compromise... He was tortured. And this is, this is a truth. If you're a believer and you seek the things of the world, you will never find joy in the things of the world, but you won't find joy in the things of the Lord at the same time. You will just be a tortured soul. So let's follow Christ. Let's follow Christ with a reckless abandon and find great joy in him. Well, verse 4, Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom and both both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house and they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. The entire city of men show up from young to old, from all the quarters. They surround the house. So this was not an isolated group. This wasn't just a small group of people into whatever they're into. We need to understand that this was the heart of the entire city. That's a big deal. And there is no question from the original language that they were saying, send the men out so we can rape them. That's just what it means. And that's horrifying. As a whole, they were against God. They had rejected God. We understood they, they had a knowledge of him through Abraham. We know Melchizedek walked that area. But they had rejected God. Now, as a whole, our country has rejected God. I'm not necessarily comparing the two, but we need to understand that there's a lot of similarities. That evilness and wickedness is running rampant in our culture as a culture, we replace God with the love of self and sin. And I believe the answer to that is to preach Jesus, to love in the name of Jesus. It's not for us to walk around and just point the finger or hold up the big sign that says, you're wrong, you're wrong. That won't do it. What we need to do is personally love the people in our lives in the name of Christ. And that one life will change will lead to another life changed. It's not necessarily, necessarily going to come through some big church event, although we do those things and we have those things periodically, but to understand the greatest effect we will have in our culture is for each one of us in this room to go out and love people in the name of Jesus. So many think that it, well, it's the pastor's job to reach the town, and that's wrong. It's all of ours 
we're all responsible. Because I can't go into your, your neighborhood the same way you can. I can't go into your, your job the same way you can. I can't go into your school. I can't, I can't enter the, the conversations that, that you have, and, and, and it would just be weird. It's not what God wants. So each one of us is called into full-time ministry, not necessarily preaching or singing, but we're called to love God and love people, and we need to be actively doing that. Who in your life right now could you share Jesus with? But we're going to need to be confronted with the fact or we compromise like Lot. If we go and share with people, would they laugh at us? Would they not take us serious? Because that is what's going to happen. But if I'm living and loving God and loving people and I share Jesus with people, they should go, I, I'm interested. Or I reject that. But they see something different. Well, here, for this city and, and the unfortunate truth, we are going to talk about this, but they, they say, bring them out so that we can know them carnally. The city had given themselves over to sexual immorality, to homosexuality. And at this point that they had reached, they thought nothing of raping the two strangers. They didn't know they were angels. We see the depths of their heart. No problem with hurting them. As a city, they were all for this. Now, homosexuality or the LGBTQ community is something that our culture is accepting without question at this point. And a lot of churches are starting to accept it. And one thing I want to say here very clearly is we need to love them. It's not approving of sin, of course, but, but, but they should not feel hated by the church. And, 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 and so often churches are so aggressively against that movement. And all that does is, is, is spit in the face of Jesus because he died for their sins. Now the balance of loving and not approving of sin is, is very difficult and takes great prayer and, and just anguish honestly so that they know they are loved but that sin is sin. Because there's no compromise. We can't call sin okay. And many churches have just said things are okay when they're not and we can't go there. But we should be known for love. And so we need to check our hearts. How do we deal with people in our culture that say, well, they're of this group or that group? Do they see hate from our face? They should see love. So you need to be praying. You need to be praying. And I'm not saying this is easy. It's in the passage, so we're talking about it. It's not something I normally want to talk about. I'm not going to find a way to put this in my lesson, but to understand that our culture is permeated with this reality, and it's just being accepted. And if your kids go to public school, they're being taught it, that it's okay and it's beautiful and, and, and that we're the monsters. But let's not make ourselves monsters by hating. Let's love. Stand for the truth. And ask God to, to be in, in the midst of it. It is a sin, homosexuality, and that lifestyle is a sin. And to act on those desires, I should say, is a sin. That's very important to realize that there are those that do have those desires, but they need to squash them like anybody else with their desires. And they need to choose to live for Christ. Leviticus 20, verse 13 says, If any man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So yes, the Old Testament says that, and it's echoed in the New Testament in Romans 1, 26 through 27. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error of their error, which was due. We see from the Old and the New Testament that God was calling this out as not okay. But again, I want to be clear, it's this isn't my opportunity, and this isn't our moment just to, to single out this one sin. So if you're here, and that's something you struggle with, and you've kept it inside, to, to understand, I'm not trying to just single this out, because everyone in this room has a desire from, from some, for some sort of sin. And each one of us must conquer that in the name of Jesus Christ, and deny the flesh, take up our cross, and follow him. And I'm not saying it's easy, but it is something that we must do. And I want to be super clear that all sexual immorality is wrong in the eyes of God. 
It's easy for the church then to lock onto this subject and then point that out and, and to have their opinion when statistically a majority of the males in the church are looking at pornography. When sexual immorality runs rampant in the church, it devastates the witness we have for Christ. And it is. And I'm not suggesting, I don't know of anybody in here, just so you know. you know. But what I do know is that we need to confront this stuff. So if you're having sex and you're not married, you're in sin. If you're cheating on your spouse, you're in sin. If you're lusting in your hearts, you are in sin. Now, sex is not bad in and of itself. God has an ordained place for it with a husband and a wife a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage. We often don't teach that in the church, but anything outside of that is sin. And, and I'll be honest, I'm not comfortable teaching this stuff. But the world is teaching it very loudly. And we need to be those that recognize we can't just point the finger and say that one's bad. We need to confront ourselves because we must walk in purity before Jesus Christ. And my favorite beatitude from the Sermon on the Mount is, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that's for us today, that if we purify our hearts, not just from these types of sins, but all sins, we will start to see God clearer and clearer, and we will experience him in greater and greater ways every day. But when we allow any sin into our lives, God's just going to disappear from us. Not because he wants it, but because we're making it happen. If I'm not hearing his voice, it's my fault. And I have to own that. So tonight, if you're not hearing the voice of God, it's your fault. So deal with it. Take care of the sin. Be purified and walk with God. Verse 6, So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him, and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. He calls it wickedness because he understood it was wrong. With all of his compromise, he said, Please don't do this. This is wrong. This is sin. Yet they didn't see it as sin because they had allowed themselves so far down the path, they were blinded to how horrific this was. But that can happen to any of us. The further we go down the path, it just becomes easier and easier for sin to get worse and worse. Our culture, our country doesn't see things the same way we do. And, and, and again, it's, it's people wanting to seek out their sin. So as Christians, let's rise up and let's love God and love people. Show them the love of Jesus Christ. So how we love people is going to change everything. So the challenge is not who to love, by the way. Because we're supposed to love everybody. It's easier for us for me to, to be selective. I'm going to love that guy because he's really, really nice. Well, I'm going to love that person because they might do something for me. I'm going to love that person because they're just not as scary. But that's, none of that's real. I mean, we need to love everybody. So the, the, the choice isn't who do we love, but how do we love the person without loving their sin? And so be in prayer, be in prayer. And, of course, we see very clearly in Scripture we need to remove the plank from our eye to deal with the speck in somebody else's. So God says, you take care of your life first, get your life together, and then, well, you can start being used by me. So we do need to walk in purity. We do need to have our lives right. Now, verse 8, See now I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. That is just horrific. That is just horrific. This passage is horrific, by the way. And so often we, we for, can forget that the Bible is just recording history, recording the things that people did, the sins they committed, the, the, the obedience they had. And as we read these things, it is shocking. It, and it should shock us. So here's a guy, and he's saying this is wickedness, and, and, and he's conflicted, and he's tormented, but he's so compromised, he literally says, send, I'll send you my daughters. Do whatever you want to them. That makes me just nauseous. That makes me nauseous. He was so compromised, he couldn't see that this was wrong in, in every way. Men, you're called to protect your wives. You're called to protect your daughters. You're called to protect your sisters. You're called to protect your mothers. 
We're called to protect those around us. He was not protecting them. We're called to protect. We need to make every effort to protect those around us, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually. It is our jobs to protect. And there's dads in here that have daughters. We need to protect. I'm not saying moms, you don't protect. Don't misunderstand that. But I'm calling out the guys here. We need to be those that protect. And and I'm not saying we all join a martial arts academy and, and stuff like that, but we need to do our part and we need to be ready. The Kenyans would laugh at me, and, and, and they weren't laughing at me, but they were just surprised because, you know, we're, we were there as missionaries, and, and they understood that people probably were never going to make it to Lisa because they understood the security system that we had, that if they did make it through the wall and make it through my dogs and make it through the metal barred doors, and this wasn't us living in fear. It was a necessity there. They put the bars on the windows because somebody had broken in previously. Um, not when we lived there, but at the end of the day, they understood that if they got through that, I did have a bow and arrow, and I was more than capable. And if they got through that, I did have bear fog, like pepper spray. And then if they got through that, I had other weapons, and, and, and it wasn't, it was just like they understood, and they would laugh like that. They're like, wow, that's a lot of security. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm going to protect my wife. And we had girl interns. And, and it, just, it, was, it was just what I was called to do. And that doesn't mean we didn't love our neighbors and all that. But if they made it through all those stages, they were clearly up to no good. So we need to protect. We need to protect. But protect them emotionally. Protect them spiritually. Raise them in the Lord. That's important. We're going to see that Lot did not raise his daughters in the Lord, and their decisions at the end of this are equally gross. But he was so compromised, he just failed in every way. Verse 9, and they said, stand back. Then they said, this one speaking to and about Lot, this one came in to stay here and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were in the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. The city's in an uproar. They hear what Lot has to say and they respond with, with anger towards him. This one came here. He acts as a judge. He was a judge. He sat in the gate. But they had rejected everything he stood for in his heart. He wasn't living it out, obviously, but they had rejected all that Lot had to say. He had zero witness with them and to them. Compromise will always lead to this. No witness for Jesus. That's just how it is. That inability to live it out. I was just thinking about simple things. Like if I, I you know, went to a mechanic and he's like, I just can't fix my own car. I don't know how to fix this. I'm not going to be like, yeah, take my car. I mean, just simple things. We wouldn't go to that guy. But, but here's the deal. If I want people to listen to Jesus, they're going to look at my life. They're going to look at my life and, and I preach, yeah, Jesus can change lives. But they, if they look at my life and they go, but your life's not changed. He didn't fix anything in you. Why would they want him? We must be changed first. We must be living it first. We must be just, just so in love with Jesus that, that as the world looks, they go, oh, it's real. They can reject it or they can receive it, but they will know that it's real. So I beg tonight, if you're not radically sold out for Christ, make some changes. And I don't mean radically sold out because you come to church two times a week or three times a week or serve, but because your heart is so invested that you will do anything for him. Well, it says here that they came to break down the door. The angels pull Lot into the house. They had to physically save them from the men because they're like, we're going to do worse to you. And then it says the angels struck them with blindness from the smallest to the greatest, all of them, all of them. They blinded them to get them to stop. I'm sure the angels could have done anything else. We see clearly that one angel wiped out like 180,000 soldiers. These guys were not limited in their abilities, but they chose to blind these guys. And what we see is that they were absolutely dedicated to their sin. 
Because it says that they became weary trying to find the door. They were so committed to their sin, even after they could no longer see, they groped to find the door so they could break it down and go inside and do what they wanted. That's just shocking how committed they were to their sin, dedicated. So what are we dedicated to? What are we dedicated to? Because the world's dedicated to their sin. Are we this dedicated to Christ that nothing will stop us from loving and serving him? That no even physical ailment. What will you do for your passions and your desires? What will you do to serve Jesus? These are questions we need to ask ourselves. Now verse 12, Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whoever you have in the city, take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has become, has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. The angels simply at this point, they had clearly seen what they needed to see. They saw the sin in the city, that it was great. And they say, hey, get everybody you have here. Gather your people. They gave him a chance to get all those that would follow him out to safety. And I was thinking about that. We have the same chance right now. Because at the end of the day, it may not be a judgment like on this city, but the fact is it's appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. So everybody that dies without Christ will go to hell. And so right now, our minds should be flooded with the people in our lives that don't know Jesus, and we should be praying for them. We should be on our knees for them. We should be weeping before the Lord for them, and we should be doing everything we can to love them so that they will see Jesus Christ. And I don't always do that. We get so busy. But we should be broken over the lost. The angel says we're going to destroy this place. Their sin was at that point. Judgment had come just should motivate us to share Jesus. Judgment is coming because we don't know when he's coming. Verse 14, so Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-law who had married his daughters and said, get up, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy the city. But to his son-in-law, he seemed to be joking. It's interesting. We know that his daughters were, were virgins and so married son-in-law, it's very simple. They were in the betrothal stage. They were technically married, you know, but not yet living together. Um, in that sense, if, if you got to see that, that the wedding feast, you know, we, he, he broke that down clearly. There was a, the betrothal period, and about a year later, there would be the actual ceremony, but it was a legal marriage. And that's just where they were at. And, and what's interesting about this is Lot chose this guy for his daughters, or these guys, he was a part of that. It wasn't just like, ah, they're, they're going to get married and I can't control it. He was a part of choosing these ungodly men for his daughters. He was compromised. He was compromised in all ways. But it seemed like a joke to them. They laughed at him when he told them about the things of, told them about the things of God. And we're going to get people that laugh at us as we share Jesus. That, that happens. And we need to understand that. But, but those, I believe those that we truly have been loving and ministering to as we share, they're not going to laugh at us. They're going to know that we don't take it as a joke, even if they choose not to believe. And we need to take that seriously. If our walk is shining for Christ, people should be drawn. And I've often heard that so many people want to come to church, want to hear more, but nobody invites them. That more people would come to church with a simple invite because they're watching Christians at work. And a lot of people actually think that this is like a club. You have to be invited or you have to have a special. And, and, it's just, and that can seem strange to us, but so many people think that. They don't think they can just walk in and come in and listen. And that, that breaks my heart. That they would think we're so exclusive. Well, no. So invite people. Invite people, not so the church grows. If it grows, great. Or if they go, I will never go to that Calvary Chapel place, then go somewhere else with them. I mean, do a Bible study at your house. I don't know the answer, but what I do know is that we should be inviting people, telling people about who Jesus is. And if our life is lined up with Christ and we're doing what he wants, we're going to see fruit. We're going to see lives change. But here they just laugh at him because he was compromised. 
So I got to ask you, who would believe you if you came and talked to them about God? Are there those that would laugh? Does your family believe you follow God? Because we come here and we have all these great professions and hands raised, and, and I'm not doubting. If you tell me where you're at, that's, that's fine. But, but would your family actually believe you follow Jesus? When kids see two Jesus, they're going to throw out both. And let me explain that. Oftentimes, homes will declare two Jesuses. We come to church and we preach Jesus of the Bible. And we talk about who he is. And then families go home and they see another Jesus in their parents. And kids will always throw both Jesuses out. That's just how it works. Now, I'm sure there's, I shouldn't say always, there's going to be a few that despite their parents will come to Christ. And I know some kids are going to go their own way regardless. But understand this, if you're shining two Jesuses, one at church and one at home, they're going to throw them both out, and that should wreck us. We also want to be careful that we don't poison our own well. We get in the car from church and we start trash-talking the sermon or the worship pastor, or the, and they just leave church and they go, yep, those people are horrible. But that's what the kids hear. That's convicting. That should, that should convict us. How we talk about the things of the Lord and the people of the Lord. And I'm not saying you have to agree with everything. You don't have to think I'm the best or whatever. I'm just filling I'm a need. But here's the deal at the end of the day. To understand that our example to our children is, is massive. And they're watching. So does your family believe you Believe in Jesus. Verse 15, when the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. He wasn't in a hurry. They're urging him. Lot, you got to take action. This, this evening, I'm urging you to take action. Don't neglect the things of the Lord. Don't put them off another day. Do what needs to be done. Verse 16, and while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. So it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. He's still lingering. He's still clearly wanting to stay compromised. He saw the sin. He understand and understood what was going to happen, but his heart was with the people of Sodom, Gomorrah. No sense of urgency to get away from his sin. Do you have a sense of urgency to get away from your sin? You should. You should. Well, I love that the angels just took their hands and drug them out. And this again just shows us the mercy because the, he said there, the Lord being merciful. He just drug them out. I'm going to save you whether you want to or not because Lot was his. Mm. But he didn't want to leave. I think this is the reason so many Christians or those that call themselves Christians linger in their sin is they just don't want to stop. They don't want to give it up. You have to want to. You have to at least want to want to. And that's a good prayer, by the way. Lord, I want to want to stop. That's an honest prayer because we look into the perfect law of liberty. We look into the Bible and we see what needs to change, but we go, ah, my heart doesn't really want to. It's a good prayer. I've prayed that prayer. Lord, I just don't have the strength. I want to change this, but I don't have the strength. And God is so faithful. I just picture him in heaven smiling, going, thanks. And he will wreck your life. And it hurts and it's painful and it's beautiful. And I am grateful that God has stepped into my life when I was weak enough just to say I want to change. I want to want to change. And I can look back at a specific time where he turned my life upside down and he kicked me. And it hurt. And I'm so grateful because it put me on the path to truly follow Jesus with all my heart, with no more compromise, no more, no more. Well, 2 Peter verse, chapter 1, verse 10 through 11, Therefore, brethren, be more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. 
For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to make our calling and election sure. The Bible's clear here. He says, check your heart. Make sure you're saved. Make sure you're saved because if you're desiring sin, I'm not saying you're not saved, but you're in a place of compromise. But I also want to say, hey, check your heart. Because a lot of people at the end of the day are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these things in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Those are church people that thought they were walking right with God. That's why I teach like this. Because I don't want a single person to walk away and go, I'm good. I'm good. Because if you're in sin, you're not good. And you may not be saved. So make your election, your call and election sure. Make sure you're right with Jesus. Just make sure you're right. That's between you and him. Again, not trying to be harsh. But when we remember that Jesus suffered brutally, beaten, his body ripped to pieces, the nails piercing him, the crown of thorns. When we remember the cross, yeah, we should, we should radically run from our sin. We should radically run to Jesus. And it wasn't just the physical burden of the cross, it was the fact that he took hell for each one of us. That should break our hearts in such a way that sin and compromise is never acceptable. And, and it's a personal thing, and then we realize it affects the rest of the world around us. So tonight, please don't think, well, I'll change for everybody around me. Change for your walk with God to be right. Why would it be okay to compromise after we see what Jesus did on the cross? It's not. The angel says, escape for your life. Don't look behind you. Don't look back. Get away. So many people look back at their sin. Oh, they pray a prayer. They start to live a Christian life. And you hear them give their testimony and they longingly look up as they talk about their sin. And that disgusts me. I've seen men do that. As they have a little smile, as they recant some of the sins before they were saved by the Lord, of course. That's disgusting. Don't ever longingly look back at your sin. And if you find yourself doing that, make your calling and election sure. I think any man or woman that can longingly look back at their sin may not be saved. I'd be terrified. Well, it's not real repentance unless we really keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Verse 18, Then Lot said to them, Please know, my lords, indeed your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. See, now the city is near enough to flee, and it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. Again, I see compromises. He barters. Let me go to this other city. I don't want to do what you say. I don't want to go to the mountains. We're going to see that he ends up in the mountains because he's afraid, but he's still compromising. And I have to wonder, too, why didn't he go to Abraham? At this point, it was him and his wife and two daughters, only four of them. There was no conflict with the herds. He should have gone back to family, back to somebody that was following God. But no compromise. Don't, don't let me go to the mountains. I, I just want to go to this little city. It's not enough. Verse 21, and he said to him, See, I have found, I have favored you concerning this thing also, in that I will not overthrow the city for." which you have spoken. Hurry, escape, therefore I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The angel does allow it, but, but it is compromise. He's ultimately, like I said, going to end up in the mountains. I think the angel knew that. Verse 23, the sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. Of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. We see total destruction. We see total destruction. Sin in our lives must be totally destroyed. Don't let it linger. Don't let it hang around. Verse 26, but his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. A lot of things, you know, people say this about this, but here's the deal. It wasn't just simply looking back. I mean, fire and brimstone, it would have sounded like a nuclear bomb probably going off. I imagine they all looked back. But the scripture is clear as you dig in. She looked back longingly. 
She looked back longingly. We already talked about that. We can't look back longingly. We can't look back and hope for what once was, that sinful life. Again, not repentance. James 1.15 says, Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. In that moment, as she looked back, it was full grown, and, and, and God judged her with the city. It brought forth death because her heart was the same as the people in the city. We can't look back at our sin. We can't look back and, and long for it. You also don't want to look back and, and just be stuck there. Let God forgive you and move forward. Let God forgive you and move forward. Verse 27, And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and towards all the land of the plain, and he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. Abraham went back to a place that he had spent time with Jesus. You know, we never want to memorialize a place, but I would encourage you to have a favorite place to pray or a favorite place to read, a place to meet with God. I think that's kind of cool. And he saw the city destroyed. He understood what God had done, and it's very clear that God showed mercy and still saved Lot, even though there was not 10. He got him out of the city. Now, the rest of this passage, we're going to go through really quick. It's fairly horrifying and doesn't need a lot of commentary. Then Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountains, and his two daughters were with him, for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar, and he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Again, I don't know why he didn't just go back to Abraham. Sometimes shame keeps us from going to the people that we know will actually help us. Don't let that overtake you. Tonight, if you're in a place where you're in sin and you, you need somebody, reach out today. Don't just leave. Don't go to some isolated place. Reach out. Ask for help. If somebody doesn't, isn't helpful, go to somebody else. Be your advocate, but don't run away like this. Now, verse 31 to the end of the chapter, Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man on earth to come into us, as is the custom of the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. It happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also, and you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Then they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. Their firstborn, the first bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. <sighs> Obviously that's just sin upon sin. He raised his children to ultimately go there. And as gross as, as that is, um, it's what he raised his children to, to believe in, the things of Sodom and Gomorrah, the sin that they partook. And, and also another thing is he drank. They knew he was going to get drunk. They knew that was something that Lot would do. So they didn't really have to force it down him. They just provided it. He got drunk, and they were able to commit their sin but think about this, if he never got drunk, this never would have happened. Sin always allows room for more sin. There is no place for drunkenness in, in the scriptures and in a believer life. The Bible's clear, being drunk is a sin. Whatever your take on alcohol is, I just want you to be clear about that, that being drunk is always a sin, and it will lead to more sin. He didn't even know it happened. Well... Sin leads to sin. Let's make sure that we're not compromising because it's just going to lead to more sin. Honestly, just a horrible passage. A horrible passage because we see a man compromised so he had an unproductive life, a wasted life. I don't think that's what any of us want here. Well, are you compromising in any area? Are you wasting your life living for yourself 
living for the things of this world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that even though these passages are hard and we don't want to hear them, we don't want to look at them, we understand that that compromise is is not a little thing. It led to the absolute downfall of this man and his witness and his family. Lord, speak to each one of us tonight. Speak to those that are listening in that, that if there's compromise in our life, that you would convict us, that you would show us, that you would give us the strength to follow you instead. Now, with everybody's eyes closed and nobody looking around, I get this was a hard passage tonight. But if you're here tonight and, and, and you felt the hand of God stirring you and, and you realize that, that you've been compromising, you're not living sold out radically in love and passionate for Jesus Christ, because ultimately that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about just you know, compromising in sin, but let's, let's be fully radically in love with Jesus Christ, over the moon, so to speak. So if you're here tonight and you recognize that, that there's been some compromise, even in any way, well, deal with your Jesus. If you're a believer, deal with your Jesus. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to cleanse you. Ask him to change your heart, to set you free. And ask him to help you fall in love with him. And if you're here tonight, or if you're listening in, but you realize that as you thought about this, make your call and election sure, and you, you, you realize I'm not saved, and you want to give your life to Jesus, it's simply believing in Jesus, that he loves you, that he died for you on the cross for your sins. He was buried, he was rose, he rose from the dead to give you life. And if you say, Jesus, I believe in you. Come into my heart, save me. You will be saved. So if you're at home and you need to pray that, you can just pray that to, to Jesus. It's not about me or this church or anything. You can pray that. For those here, since we're here, if you want to give your life to Jesus, I'm going to ask that you raise your hand. I'm going to ask that you, you look me in the eye and you raise your hand. Is there anybody here tonight you want to say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I've been living a life of compromise with this world. I'm not saved. I need to give my life to Jesus. Is there anybody here tonight? Ah, Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you. And we long for just to be in your presence. So tonight I ask that your Holy Spirit would fill us, you would guide us, you would direct us, and you would just send us out and use us for your kingdom and for your glory, that we would fall more in love with you than we've ever been, so that we can shine for the dark world around us. I love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.